Chapter Six of Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter Six. Railroad Service. From the operating room of the telegraph office, I had now stepped into the open world, and the change at first was far from agreeable. I had just reached my eighteenth birthday, and I do not see how it could be possible for any boy to arrive at that age much freer from a knowledge of anything but what was pure and good. I do not believe, up to that time, I had ever spoken a bad word in my life, and seldom heard one. I knew nothing of the base and the vile. Fortunately, I had always been brought in contact with good people. I was now plunged at once into the company of coarse men, for the office was temporarily only a portion of the shops and the headquarters for the freight conductors, brakemen, and firemen. All of them had access to the same room with Superintendent Scott and myself, and they availed themselves of it. This was a different world, indeed, from that to which I had been accustomed. I was not happy about it. I ate, necessarily, of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil for the first time. But there were still the sweet and pure surroundings of home, where nothing coarse or wicked ever entered, and besides, there was the world in which I dwelt with my companions, all of them refined young men striving to improve themselves and become respected citizens. I passed through this phase of my life, detesting what was foreign to my nature and my early education. The experience with coarse men was probably beneficial because it gave me a scunner, disgust, to use a Scotism, at chewing or smoking tobacco, also at swearing or the use of improper language, which fortunately remained with me through life. I do not wish to suggest that the men of whom I have spoken were really degraded or bad characters. The habit of swearing with coarse talk, chewing, and smoking tobacco, and snuffing were more prevalent then than today, and meant less than in this age. Railroading was new, and many rough characters were attracted to it from the river service. But many of the men were fine young fellows who have lived to be highly respectable citizens and to occupy responsible positions. And I must say that one and all of them were most kind to me. Many are yet living from whom I hear occasionally and regard with affection. A change came at last when Mr. Scott had his own office, which he and I occupied. I was soon sent by Mr. Scott to Altoona to get the monthly payrolls and checks. The railroad line was not completed over the Allegheny Mountains at that time, and I had to pass over the inclined plains which made the journey a remarkable one to me. Altoona was then composed of a few houses built by the company. The shops were under construction, and there was nothing of the large city which now occupies the site. It was there that I saw for the first time the great man in our railroad field, Mr. Lombert, General Superintendent. His secretary at that time was my friend Robert Pitcairn, for whom I had obtained a situation on the railroad, so that Davy, Bob, and Andy were still together in the same service. We had all left the telegraph company for the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. Mr. Lombert was very different from Mr. Scott. He was not sociable, but rather stern and unbending. Judge then of Robert's surprise and my own when, after saying a few words to me, Mr. Lombert added, You must come down and take tea with us tonight. I stammered out something of acceptance and awaited the appointed hour with great trepidation. Up to this time, I considered that invitation the greatest honor I had received. Mrs. Lombert was exceedingly kind, and Mr. Lombert's introduction of me to her was, This is Mr. Scott's Andy. I was very proud indeed of being recognized as belonging to Mr. Scott. An incident happened on this trip which might have blasted my career for a time. I started next morning for Pittsburgh with the payrolls and checks, as I thought, securely placed under my waistcoat, as it was too large a package for my pockets. I was a very enthusiastic railroader at that time and preferred riding upon the engine. I got upon the engine that took me to Hollidaysburg, where the state railroad over the mountain was joined up. 
It was a very rough ride indeed, and at one place, uneasily feeling for the payroll package, I was horrified to find that the jolting of the train had shaken it out. I had lost it. There was no use in disguising the fact that such a failure would ruin me. To have been sent for the payrolls and checks and to lose the package, which I should have grasped as my honor, was a dreadful showing. I called the engineer and told him it must have been shaken out within the last few miles. Would he reverse his engine and run back for it? Kind soul, he did so. I watched the line, and on the very banks of a large stream, within a few feet of the water, I saw that package lying. I could scarcely believe my eyes. I ran down and grasped it. It was all right. Need I add that it never passed out of my firm grasp again until it was safe in Pittsburgh? The engineer and fireman were the only persons who knew of my carelessness, and I had their assurance that it would not be told. It was long after the event that I ventured to tell the story. Suppose that package had fallen just a few feet farther away and been swept down by the stream. How many years of faithful service would it have required upon my part to wipe out the effect of that one piece of carelessness? I could no longer have enjoyed the confidence of those whose confidence was essential to success had fortune not favored me. I have never since believed in being too hard on a young man, even if he does commit a dreadful mistake or two. And I have always tried in judging such to remember the difference it would have made in my own career, but for an accident which restored to me that lost package at the edge of the stream a few miles from Hollidaysburg. I could go straight to the very spot today, and often as I passed over that line afterwards, I never failed to see that light brown package lying upon the bank. It seemed to be calling, All right, my boy, the good gods were with you, and don't do it again. At an early age, I became a strong anti-slavery partisan and hailed with enthusiasm the first national meeting of the Republican Party in Pittsburgh, February 22, 1856, although too young to vote. I watched the prominent men as they walked the streets, lost in admiration for Senators Wilson, Hale, and others. Sometime before I had organized among the railroad men a club of a hundred for the New York Weekly Tribune, and ventured occasionally upon the short notes to the great editor, Horace Greeley, who did so much to arouse the people to action upon this vital question. The first time I saw my work in type in the then flaming organ of freedom certainly marked a stage in my career. I kept that Tribune for years. Looking back today, one cannot help regretting so high a price as the Civil War had to be paid to free our land from the curse. But it was not slavery alone that needed abolition. The loose federal system, with state rights so prominent, would inevitably have prevented, or at least long delayed, the formation of one solid, all-powerful central government. The tendency under the Southern idea was centrifugal. Today it is centripetal all drawn toward the center under the sway of the supreme court the decisions of which are very properly half the dicta of lawyers and half the work of statesmen uniformity in many fields must be secured marriage divorce bankruptcy railroad supervision control of corporations and some other departments should in some measure be brought under one head Rereading this paragraph today, July 1907, written many years ago, it seems prophetic. These are now burning questions. It was not long after this that the railroad company constructed its own telegraph line. We had to supply it with operators. Most of these were taught in our offices at Pittsburgh. The telegraph business continued to increase with startling rapidity. We could scarcely provide facilities fast enough new telegraph offices were required. My fellow messenger boy, Davy McCargo, I appointed superintendent of the telegraph department March 11, 1859. I have been told that Davy and myself are entitled to the credit of being the first to employ young women as telegraph operators in the United States upon railroads, or perhaps in any branch. At all events, we placed girls in various offices as pupils, taught and then put them in charge of offices as occasion required. Among the first of these was my cousin, Miss Maria Hogan. She was the operator at the freight station in Pittsburgh, and with her were placed successive pupils, her office becoming a school. 
Our experience was that young women operators were more to be relied upon than young men. Among all the new occupations invaded by women, I do not know of any better suited for them than that of telegraph operator. Mr. Scott was one of the most delightful superiors that anybody could have, and I soon became warmly attached to him. He was my great man, and all the hero worship that is inherent in youth I showered upon him. I soon began placing him in imagination in the presidency of the Great Pennsylvania Railroad, a position which he afterwards attained. Under him I gradually performed duties not strictly belonging to my department, and I can attribute my decided advancement in the service to one well-remembered incident. The railway was a single line. Telegraph orders to trains often became necessary, although it was not then a regular practice to run trains by telegraph. No one but the superintendent himself was permitted to give a train order on any part of the Pennsylvania system, or indeed of any other system. I believe at that time it was then a dangerous expedient to give telegraphic orders, for the whole system of railway management was still in its infancy, and men had not yet been trained for it. It was necessary for Mr. Scott to go out night after night to breakdowns or wrecks to superintend the clearing of the line. He was necessarily absent from the office on many mornings. One morning I reached the office and found that a serious accident on the Eastern Division had delayed the express passenger train westward, and that the passenger train eastward was proceeding with a flagman in advance at every curve. The freight trains in both directions were all standing still upon the sidings. Mr. Scott was not to be found. Finally, I could not resist the temptation to plunge in, take the responsibility, give train orders, and set matters going. Death or Westminster Abbey flashed across my mind. I knew it was dismissal, disgrace, perhaps criminal punishment for me if I erred. On the other hand, I could bring in the wearied freight train men who had lain out all night. I could set everything in motion. I knew I could. I had often done it in wiring Mr. Scott's orders. I knew just what to do, and so I began. I gave the orders in his name, started every train, sat at the instrument watching every tick, carried the trains along from station to station, took extra precautions, and had everything running smoothly when Mr. Scott at last reached the office. He had heard of the delays. His first words were, Well, how are matters? He came to my side quickly, grasped the pencil, and began to write his orders. I had then to speak, and timidly said, Mr. Scott, I could not find you anywhere, and I gave these orders in your name early this morning. Are they going all right? Where is the Eastern Express? I showed him the messages and gave him the position of every train on the line. Freights, ballast trains, everything. Showed him the answers of the various conductors, the latest reports at the stations where the various trains had passed. All was right. He looked in my face for a second. I scarcely dared look in his. I did not know what was going to happen. He did not say one word, but again looked carefully over all that had taken place. Still, he said nothing. After a little while, he moved away from my desk to his own, and that was the end of it. He was afraid to approve what I had done, yet he had not censured me. If it came out all right, it was all right. If it came out all wrong, the responsibility was mine. So it stood but I noticed that he came in very regularly and in good time for some mornings after that. Of course, I never spoke to anyone about it. None of the trainsmen knew that Mr. Scott had not personally given the orders. I had almost made up my mind that if the like occurred again, I would not repeat my proceedings of that morning unless I was authorized to do so. I was feeling rather distressed about what I had done until I heard from Mr. Franciscus, who was then in charge of the freighting department at Pittsburgh, that Mr. Scott, the evening after the memorable morning, had said to him, Do you know what that little white-haired Scotch devil of mine did? No. I'm blamed if he didn't run every train on the division in my name without the slightest authority. And did he do it all right? asked Franciscus. Oh, yes, all right. This satisfied me. Of course I had my cue for the next occasion, and went boldly in. From that date it was very seldom that Mr. Scott gave a train order.
The greatest man of all on my horizon at this time was John Edgar Thompson, president of the Pennsylvania, and for whom our steel rail mills were afterward named. He was the most reserved and silent of men, next to General Grant, that I ever knew, although General Grant was more voluble when at home with friends. He walked about as if he saw nobody when he made his periodical visits to Pittsburgh. This reserve, I learned afterwards, was purely the result of shyness. I was surprised when, in Mr. Scott's office, he came to the telegraph instrument and greeted me as Scott's Andy. But I learned afterwards that he had heard of my train-running exploit. The battle of life is already half won by the young man who is brought personally in contact with high officials, and the great aim of every boy should be to do something beyond the sphere of his duties something which attracts the attention of those over him. Some time after this, Mr. Scott wished to travel for a week or two and asked authority from Mr. Lombert to leave me in charge of the division. Pretty bold man he was, for I was then not very far out of my teens. It was granted. Here was a coveted opportunity of my life, with the exception of one accident caused by the inexcusable negligence of a ballast train crew, everything went well in his absence but that this accident should occur was gall and wormwood to me. Determined to fulfill all the duties of the station, I held a court-martial, examined those concerned, dismissed peremptorily the chief offender, and suspended two others for their share in the catastrophe. Mr. Scott, after his return, of course, was advised of the accident, and proposed to investigate and deal with the matter. I felt I had gone too far, but having taken the step, I informed him that all that had been settled. I had investigated the matter and punished the guilty. Some of these appealed to Mr. Scott for a reopening of the case, but this I never could have agreed to, had it been pressed. More by look, I think, than by word, Mr. Scott understood my feelings upon this delicate point, and acquiesced. It is probable he was afraid I had been too severe, and very likely he was correct. Some years after this, when I myself was superintendent of the division, I always had a soft spot in my heart for the men then suspended for a time. I had felt qualms of conscience about my action in this, my first court. A new judge is very apt to stand so straight as really to lean a little backward. Only experience teaches the supreme force of gentleness. Light but certain punishment, when necessary, is most effective. Severe punishments are not needed, and a judicious pardon, for the first offense at least, is often best of all. As the half-dozen young men who constituted our inner circle grew in knowledge, it was inevitable that the mysteries of life and death, the here and the hereafter, should cross our path and have to be grappled with. We had all been reared by good, honest, self-respecting parents, members of one or another of the religious sects. Through the influence of Mrs. McMillan, wife of one of the leading Presbyterian ministers of Pittsburgh, we were drawn into the social circle of her husband's church. As I read this on the Moors, July 16, 1912, I have before me a note from Mrs. McMillan from London in her 80th year. Two of her daughters were married in London last week to university professors. One remains in Britain, the other has accepted an appointment in Boston. Eminent men both. So draws our English-speaking race together. Mr. McMillan was a good strict Calvinist of the old school. His charming wife, a born leader of the young. We were all more at home with her and enjoyed ourselves more at her home gatherings than elsewhere. This led to some of us occasionally attending her church. A sermon of the strongest kind upon predestination, which Miller heard there, brought the subject of theology upon us, and it would not down. Mr. Miller's people were strong Methodists, and Tom had known little of dogmas. This doctrine of predestination, including infant damnation, some born to glory and others to the opposite, appalled him. To my astonishment, I learned that, going to Mr. McMillan after the sermon to talk over the matter, Tom had blurted out at the finish, Mr. McMillan, if your idea were correct, your God would be a perfect devil, and left the astonished minister to himself. This formed the subject of our Sunday afternoon conferences for many a week. Was that true or not, and what was to be the consequence of Tom's declaration? Should we no longer be welcome guests of Mrs. McMillan?' 
We could have spared the minister, perhaps, but none of us relished the idea of banishment from his wife's delightful reunions. There was one point clear. Carlyle's struggles over these matters had impressed us, and we could follow him in his resolve. If it be incredible, in God's name let it be discredited. It was only the truth that could make us free, and the truth, the whole truth, we should pursue. Once introduced, of course, the subject remained with us, and one after the other the dogmas were voted down as the mistaken ideas of men of a less enlightened age. I forget who first started us with a second axiom. It was one we often dwelt upon. A forgiving God would be the noblest work of man. We accept it as proven that each stage of civilization creates its own God, and that as man ascends and becomes better, his conception of the unknown likewise improves. Thereafter, we all became less theological, but I am sure more truly religious. The crisis passed. Happily, we were not excluded from Mrs. McMillan's society. It was a notable day, however, when we resolved to stand by Miller's statement, even if it involved banishment and worse. We young men were getting to be pretty wild boys about theology, although more truly reverent about religion. The first great loss to our circle came when John Phipps was killed by a fall from a horse. This struck home to all of us, yet I remember I could then say to myself, John has, as it were, just gone home to England where he was born. We are all to follow him soon and live forever together. I had then no doubts. It was not a hope I was pressing to my heart, but a certainty. Happy those who in their agony have such a refuge. We should all take Plato's advice and never give up everlasting hope, alluring ourselves as with enchantments, for the hope is noble and the reward is great. Quite right. It would be no greater miracle that brought us into another world to live forever with our dearest than that which has brought us into this one to live a lifetime with them. Both are equally incomprehensible to finite beings. Let us therefore comfort ourselves with everlasting hope, as with enchantments, as Plato recommends, never forgetting, however, that we all have our duties here and that the kingdom of heaven is within us. It also passed into an axiom with us that he who proclaims there is no hereafter is as foolish as he who proclaims there is, since neither can know, though all may and should hope. Meanwhile, home our heaven, instead of heaven our home, was our motto. During these years of which I have been writing, the family fortunes had been steadily improving. My thirty-five dollars a month had grown to forty, an unsolicited advance having been made by Mr. Scott. It was part of my duty to pay the men every month. We used checks upon the bank, and I drew my salary invariably in two twenty-dollar gold pieces. They seemed to me the prettiest works of art in the world. It was decided in family council that we could venture to buy the lot and the two small frame houses upon it, in one of which we had lived, and the other a four-roomed house which till then had been occupied by my uncle and Aunt Hogan, who had removed elsewhere. It was through the aid of my dear Aunt Aitken that we had been placed in the small home above the weaver's shop, and it was now our turn to be able to ask her to return to the house that formerly had been her own. In the same way, after we had occupied the four-roomed house, Uncle Hogan, having passed away, we were able to restore Aunt Hogan to her old home when we removed to Altoona. One hundred dollars cash was paid upon purchase, and the total price, as I remember, was seven hundred dollars. The struggle then was to make up the semi-annual payments of interest and as great an amount of the principal as we could save. It was not long before the debt was cleared off and we were property holders, but before that was accomplished, the first sad break occurred in our family. In my father's death, October 2, 1855, Fortunately for the three remaining members, life's duties were pressing. Sorrow and duty contended, and we had to work. The expenses connected with his illness had to be saved and paid, and we had not up to this time such store in reserve. And here comes in one of the sweet incidents of our early life in America. The principal member of our small Swedenborgian society was Mr. David McCandless, 
He had taken some notice of my father and mother, but beyond a few passing words at church on Sundays, I do not remember that they had ever been brought in close contact. He knew Aunt Aiken well, however, and now sent for her to say that if my mother required any money assistance at this sad period, he would be very pleased to advance whatever was necessary. He had heard much of my heroic mother, and that was sufficient. One gets so many kind offers of assistance when assistance is no longer necessary, or when one is in a position which would probably enable him to repay a favor, that it is delightful to record an act of pure and disinterested benevolence. Here was a poor Scottish woman bereft of her husband, with her eldest son just getting a start, and a second in his early teens, whose misfortunes appealed to this man, and who in the most delicate manner sought to mitigate them. Although my mother was able to decline the proffered aid, it is needless to say that Mr. McCandless obtained a place in our hearts sacred to himself. I am a firm believer in the doctrine that people deserving necessary assistance at critical periods in their career usually receive it. There are many splendid natures in the world, men and women who are not only willing but anxious to stretch forth a helping hand to those they know to be worthy. As a rule, those who show willingness to help themselves need not fear about obtaining the help of others. Father's death threw upon me the management of affairs to a greater extent than ever. Mother kept on the binding of shoes, Tom went steadily to the public school, and I continued with Mr. Scott in the service of the railroad company. Just at this time, Fortunatus knocked at our door. Mr. Scott asked me if I had five hundred dollars. If so, he said he wished to make an investment for me. Five hundred cents was much nearer my capital. I certainly had not fifty dollars saved for investment, but I was not going to miss the chance of becoming financially connected with my leader and great man. So I said boldly, I thought I could manage that sum. He then told me that there were ten shares of Adams Express stock that he could buy, which had belonged to a station agent, Mr. Reynolds of Wilkinsburg. Of course, this was reported to the head of the family that evening, and she was not long in suggesting what might be done. When did she ever fail? We had then paid five hundred dollars upon the house, and in some way she thought this might be pledged as security for a loan. My mother took the steamer the next morning for East Liverpool, arriving at night, and through her brother there the money was secured. He was a justice of the peace a well-known resident of that then small town, and had numerous sums in hand from farmers for investment. Our house was mortgaged, and mother brought back the five hundred dollars, which I handed over to Mr. Scott, who soon obtained for me the coveted ten shares in return. There was, unexpectedly, an additional hundred dollars to pay as a premium, but Mr. Scott kindly said I could pay that when convenient, and this, of course, was an easy matter to do. This was my first investment. In those good old days, monthly dividends were more plentiful than now, and Adams Express paid a monthly dividend. One morning, a white envelope was lying upon my desk, addressed in a big John Hancock hand to Andrew Carnegie, Esquire. Esquire tickled the boys and me inordinately. At one corner was seen the round stamp of Adams Express Company. I opened the envelope. All it contained was a check for ten dollars upon the Gold Exchange Bank of New York. I shall remember that check as long as I live, and that John Hancock signature of J. C. Babcock, cashier. It gave me the first penny of revenue from capital, something that I had not worked for with the sweat of my brow. Eureka! I cried. Here's the goose that lays the golden egg. It was the custom of our party to spend Sunday afternoons in the woods. I kept the first check and showed it as we sat under the trees in a favorite grove we had found near Woods Run. The effect produced upon my companions was overwhelming. None of them had imagined such an investment possible. We resolved to save and to watch for the next opportunity for investment in which all of us should share, and for years afterward we divided our trifling investments and worked together almost as partners. Up to this time, my circle of acquaintances had not enlarged much. Mrs. Franciscus, wife of our freight agent, was very kind and on several occasions asked me to her house in Pittsburgh. She often spoke of the first time I rang the bell of the house in Third Street to deliver a message from Mr. Scott. 
She asked me to come in. I bashfully declined, and it required coaxing upon her part to overcome my shyness. She was never able, for years, to induce me to partake of a meal in her house. I had great timidity about going into other people's houses, until late in life, but Mr. Scott would occasionally insist upon my going to his hotel and taking a meal with him, and these were great occasions for me. Mr. Franciscus's was the first considerable house, with the exception of Mr. Lombert's at Altoona, I had ever entered, as far as I recollect. Every house was fashionable in my eyes that was upon any one of the principal streets, provided it had a hall entrance. I had never spent a night in a strange house in my life until Mr. Stokes of Greensburg, chief counsel of the Pennsylvania Railroad, invited me to his beautiful home in the country to pass a Sunday. It was an odd thing for Mr. Stokes to do, for I could little interest a brilliant and educated man like him. The reason for my receiving such an honor was a communication I had written for the Pittsburgh Journal. Even in my teens, I was a scribbler for the press. To be an editor was one of my ambitions. Horace Greeley and the Tribune was my ideal of human triumph. Strange that there should have come a day when I could have bought the Tribune. But by that time, the pearl had lost its luster. Our air castles are often within our grasp late in life, but then they charm not. The subject of my article was upon the attitude of the city toward the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. It was signed anonymously, and I was surprised to find it got a prominent place in the columns of the journal, then owned and edited by Robert M. Riddle. I, as operator, received a telegram addressed to Mr. Scott and signed by Mr. Stokes, asking him to ascertain from Mr. Riddle who the author of that communication was. I knew that Mr. Riddle could not tell the author, because he did not know him, but at the same time I was afraid that if Mr. Scott called upon him he would hand him the manuscript, which Mr. Scott would certainly recognize at a glance. I therefore made a clean breast of it to Mr. Scott and told him I was the author. He seemed incredulous. He said he had read it that morning and wondered who had written it. His incredulous look did not pass me unnoticed. The pen was getting to be a weapon with me. Mr. Stokes' invitation to spend Sunday with him followed soon after, and the visit is one of the bright spots in my life. Henceforth we were great friends." The grandeur of Mr. Stokes' home impressed me, but the one feature of it that eclipsed all else was a marble mantel in his library. In the center of the arch, carved in the marble, was an open book with this inscription, He that cannot reason is a fool, he that will not a bigot, he that dare not a slave. These noble words thrilled me. I said to myself, Some day... Some day I'll have a library. That was a look ahead. And these words shall grace the mantle as here. And so they do in New York and Skibo today. Another Sunday which I spent at his home after an interval of several years was also noteworthy. I had then become the superintendent of the Pittsburgh Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The South had seceded. I was all aflame for the flag. Mr. Stokes, being a leading Democrat, argued against the right of the North to use force for the preservation of the Union. He gave vent to sentiments which caused me to lose my self-control, and I exclaimed, Mr. Stokes, we shall be hanging men like you in less than six weeks. I hear his laugh as I write, and his voice calling to his wife in the adjoining room, Nancy, Nancy, listen to this young Scotch devil. He says they will be hanging men like me in less than six weeks. Strange things happened in those days. A short time after, that same Mr. Stokes was applying to me in Washington to help him to a major's commission in the volunteer forces. I was then in the Secretary of War's office, helping to manage the military railroads and telegraphs for the government. This appointment he secured, and ever after was Major Stokes, so that the man who doubted the right of the North to fight for the Union had himself drawn sword in the good cause. Men at first argued and theorized about constitutional rights. It made all the difference in the world when the flag was fired upon. In a moment everything was ablaze, paper, constitutions included. The Union and Old Glory. That was all the people cared for, but that was enough.' 
The Constitution was intended to ensure one flag, and as Colonel Ingersoll proclaimed, there was not air enough on the American continent to float two. End of chapter 6 Recording by William Tomko of Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 7. Superintendent of the Pennsylvania. Mr. Scott was promoted to be the general superintendent of the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1856, taking Mr. Lumbert's place, and he took me, then in my twenty-third year, with him to Altoona. This breaking up of associations in Pittsburgh was a sore trial, but nothing could be allowed to interfere for a moment with my business career. My mother was satisfied upon this point, great as the strain was upon her. Besides, follow my leader was due to so true a friend as Mr. Scott had been. His promotion to the superintendency gave rise to some jealousy, and besides that, he was confronted with a strike at the very beginning of his appointment. He had lost his wife in Pittsburgh a short time before, and had his lonely hours. He was a stranger in Altoona, his new headquarters, and there was none but myself seemingly of whom he could make a companion. We lived for many weeks at the railway hotel together before he took up housekeeping and brought his children from Pittsburgh, and at his desire I occupied the same large bedroom with him. He seemed anxious always to have me near him. The strike became more and more threatening. I remember being awakened one night and told that the freight train men had left their trains at Mifflin, that the line was blocked on this account and all traffic stopped. Mr. Scott was then sleeping soundly. It seemed to me a pity to disturb him, knowing how overworked and over-anxious he was. But he awoke, and I suggested that I should go up and attend to the matter. He seemed to murmur assent, not being more than half awake. So I went to the office, and in his name argued the question with the men, and promised them a hearing next day at Altoona. I succeeded in getting them to resume their duties, and to start the traffic. Not only were the trainmen in a rebellious mood, but the men in the shops were rapidly organizing to join with the disaffected. This I learned in a curious manner. One night, as I was walking home in the dark, I became aware that a man was following me. By and by he came up to me and said, I must not be seen with you, but you did me a favor once, and I then resolved if ever I could serve you, I would do it. I called at the office in Pittsburgh and asked for work as a blacksmith. You said there was no work then at Pittsburgh, but perhaps employment could be had at Altoona, and if I would wait a few minutes, you would ask my telegraph. You took the trouble to do so, examined my recommendations, and gave me a pass, and sent me here. I have a splendid job. My wife and family are here, and I was never so well situated in my life. And now I want to tell you something for your good. I listened, and he went on to say that a paper was being rapidly signed by the shopmen, pledging themselves to strike on Monday next. There was no time to be lost. I told Mr. Scott in the morning, and he at once had printed notices posted in the shops that all men who had signed the paper, pledging themselves to strike, were dismissed, and they should call at the office to be paid. A list of the names of the signers had come into our possession in the meantime, and this fact was announced consternation followed, and the threatened strike was broken. I have had many incidents such as that of the blacksmith in my life. Slight attentions or a kind word to the humble often bring back rewards as great as it is unlooked for. No kind action is ever lost. Even to this day I occasionally meet men whom I had forgotten who recall some trifling attention I have been able to pay them, especially when in charge at Washington of government railways and telegraphs during the Civil War, when I could pass people within the lines, a father helped to reach a wounded or sick son at the front, or enabled to bring home his remains, or some similar service. 
I am indebted to these trifles for some of the happiest attentions and the most pleasing incidents of my life. And there is this about such actions. They are disinterested, and the reward is sweet in proportion to the humbleness of the individual whom you have obliged. It counts many times more to do a kindness to a poor working man than to a millionaire who may be able some day to repay the favor. How true Wordsworth's lines! The best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. The chief happening, judged by its consequences, of the two years I spent with Mr. Scott at Altoona, arose from my being the principal witness in a suit against the company, which was being tried at Greensburg by the brilliant Major Stokes, my first host. It was feared that I was about to be subpoenaed by the plaintiff and the major wishing a postponement of the case asked mr scott to send me out of the state as rapidly as possible this was a happy change for me as i was enabled to visit my two bosom companions miller and wilson then in the railway service at crestline ohio on my way thither while sitting on the end seat of the rear car watching the line a farmer-looking man approached me he carried a small green bag in his hand he said the brakeman had informed him i was connected with the pennsylvania railroad he wished to show me the model of a car which he had invented for night travelling he took a small model out of the bag which showed a section of a sleeping car this was the celebrated t t woodruff the inventor of that now indispensable adjunct of civilization the sleeping car its importance flashed upon me I asked him if he would come to Altoona if I sent for him, and I promised to lay the matter before Mr. Scott at once upon my return. I could not get that sleeping car idea out of my mind, and was most anxious to return to Altoona that I might press my views upon Mr. Scott. When I did so, he thought I was taking time by the forelock, but was quite receptive, and said I might telegraph for the patentee. He came and contracted to place two of his cars upon the line as soon as they could be built. After this, Mr. Woodruff, greatly to my surprise, asked me if I would not join him in the new enterprise and offered me an eighth interest in the venture. I promptly accepted his offer, trusting to be able to make payments somehow or other. The two cars were to be paid for by monthly installments after delivery. When the time came for making the first payment, my portion was two hundred, and seventeen and a half dollars. I boldly decided to apply to the local banker, Mr. Lloyd, for a loan of that sum. I explained the matter to him, and I remember that he put his great arm, he was six feet three or four, around me, saying, Why, of course I will lend it. You are all right, Andy. And here I made my first note, and actually got a banker to take it. A proud moment, that, in a young man's career. The sleeping cars were a great success, and their monthly receipts paid the monthly installments. The first considerable sum I made was from this source. Today, July 19, 1909, as I reread this, how glad I am that I have recently heard from Mr. Lloyd's married daughter telling me of her father's deep affection for me, thus making me very happy indeed. One important change in our life at Altoona, after my mother and brother arrived, was that, instead of continuing to live exclusively by ourselves, it was considered necessary that we should have a servant. It was with the greatest reluctance my mother could be brought to admit a stranger into the family circle. She had been everything and had done everything for her two boys. This was her life, and she resented with all a strong woman's jealousy the introduction of a stranger who was to be permitted to do anything whatever in the home. She had cooked and served her boys, washed their clothes and mended them, made their beds, cleaned their home. Who dare rob her of those motherly privileges? But, nevertheless, we could not escape the inevitable servant girl. One came, and others followed, and with these came also the destruction of much of that genuine family happiness which flows from exclusiveness. Being served by others is a poor substitute for a mother's labor of love. The ostentatious meal prepared by a strange cook, whom one seldom sees, and served by hands paid for the task, lacks the sweetness of that which a mother's hands lay before you as the expression and proof of her devotion. 
Among her manifold blessings I have to be thankful for is that neither nurse nor governess was my companion in infancy. No wonder the children of the poor are distinguished for the warmest affection and the closest adherence to family ties and are characterized by a filial regard far stronger than that of those who are mistakenly called more fortunate in life. They have passed the impressionable years of childhood and youth in constant loving contact with father and mother. To each they are all in all, no third person coming between. The child that has in his father a teacher, companion, and counselor, and whose mother is to him a nurse, seamstress, governess, teacher, companion, heroine, and saint all in one, has a heritage to which the child of wealth remains a stranger. There comes a time, although the fond mother cannot see it, when a grown son has to put his arms around his saint and, kissing her tenderly, try to explain to her that it would be much better were she to let him help her in some ways. That, being out in the world among men and dealing with affairs, he sometimes sees changes which it would be desirable to make. That the mode of life delightful for young boys should be changed in some respects and the house made suitable for their friends to enter. Especially should the slaving mother live the life of ease hereafter, reading and visiting more and entertaining dear friends. In short, rising to her proper and deserved position as her ladyship. Of course, the change was very hard upon my mother, but she finally recognized the necessity for it, probably realized for the first time that her eldest son was getting on. Dear mother, I pleaded, my arms still around her, you have done everything for and have been everything to Tom and me, and now do let me do something for you. Let us be partners, and let us always think what is best for each other. The time has come for you to play the lady, and some of these days you are to ride in your carriage, meanwhile to get that girl in to help you. Tom and I would like this. The victory was won, and my mother began to go out with us and visit her neighbors. She had not to learn self-possession nor good manners. These were innate, and as for education, knowledge, rare good sense, and kindliness, seldom was she to meet her equal. I wrote never instead of seldom, and then struck it out. Nevertheless, my private opinion is reserved. Life at Altoona was made more agreeable for me through Mr. Scott's niece, Miss Rebecca Stewart, who kept house for him. She played the part of elder sister to me to perfection, especially when Mr. Scott was called to Philadelphia or elsewhere. We were much together, often driving in the afternoons through the woods. The intimacy did not cease for many years, and rereading some of her letters in 1906, I realized more than ever my indebtedness to her. She was not much beyond my own age, but always seemed a great deal older. Certainly, she was more mature and quite capable of playing the elder sister's part. It was to her I looked up in those days as the perfect lady. Sorry am I, our paths parted so widely in later years. Her daughter married the Earl of Sussex, and her home in late years has been abroad. July nineteenth, 1909, Mrs. Carnegie and I found my elder sister friend, April last, now in widowhood, in Paris, her sister and also her daughter, all well and happy. A great pleasure indeed. There are no substitutes for the true friends of youth. Mr. Scott remained at Altoona for about three years when deserved promotion came to him. In 1859 he was made vice president of the company with his office in Philadelphia. What was to become of me was a serious question. Would he take me with him or must I remain at Altoona with a new official? The thought was to me unbearable. To part with Mr. Scott was hard enough. To serve a new official in his place I did not believe possible. The sun rose and set upon his head, so far as I was concerned. The thought of my promotion, except through him, never entered my mind. He returned from his interview with the President at Philadelphia and asked me to come into the private room in his house, which communicated with the office. He told me it had been settled that he should remove to Philadelphia. Mr. Enoch Lewis, the division superintendent, was to be his successor. I listened with great interest as he approached the inevitable disclosure as to what he was going to do with me. He said, finally, Now, about yourself, do you think you can manage the Pittsburgh division? 
I was at an age when I thought I could manage anything. I knew nothing that I would not attempt, but it had never occurred to me that anybody else, much less Mr. Scott, would entertain the idea that I was as yet fit to do anything of the kind proposed. I was only twenty-four years old, but my model then was Lord John Russell, of whom it was said he would take the command of the Channel Fleet tomorrow. So would Wallace or Bruce. I told Mr. Scott I thought I could. Well, he said, Mr. Potts, who was then superintendent of the Pittsburgh Division, is to be promoted to the Transportation Department in Philadelphia, and I recommended you to the President as his successor. He agreed to give you a trial. What salary do you think you should have? Salary, I said, quite offended. What do I care for salary? I do not want the salary. I want the position. It is glory enough to go back to the Pittsburgh Division in your former place. You can make my salary just what you please, and you need not give me any more than what I am getting now. That was sixty-five dollars a month. You know, he said, I received fifteen hundred dollars a year when I was there, and Mr. Potts is receiving eighteen hundred. I think it would be right to start you at fifteen hundred dollars, and after a while, if you succeed, you will get the eighteen hundred. Would that be satisfactory? Oh, please, I said, don't speak to me of money. It was not a case of mere hire and salary, and then and there my promotion was sealed. I was to have a department to myself, and instead of signing T.A.S., orders between Pittsburgh and Altoona would now be signed A.C. That was glory enough for me. The order appointing me superintendent of the Pittsburgh Division was issued December 1, 1859. Preparations for removing the family were made at once. The change was hailed with joy, for although our residence in Altoona had many advantages, especially as we had a large house with some ground about it in a pleasant part of the suburbs, and therefore many of the pleasures of country life, all these did not weigh as a feather in the scale as against the return to old friends and associations in dirty, smoky Pittsburgh. My brother Tom had learned telegraphy during his residence in Altoona, and he returned with me and became my secretary. The winter following my appointment was one of the most severe ever known. The line was poorly constructed, the equipment inefficient and totally inadequate for the business that was crowding upon it. The rails were laid upon huge blocks of stone, cast-iron chairs for holding the rails were used, and I have known as many as forty-seven of those to break in one night. No wonder the wrecks were frequent. The superintendent of a division in those days was expected to run trains by telegraph at night to go out and remove all wrecks and indeed to do everything. At one time, for eight days, I was constantly upon the line, day and night, at one wreck or obstruction after another. I was probably the most inconsiderate superintendent that ever was entrusted with the management of a great property for never knowing fatigue myself being kept up by a sense of responsibility probably i overworked the men and was not careful enough in considering the limits of human endurance i have always been able to sleep at any time snatches of half an hour at intervals during the night in a dirty freight car were sufficient the Civil War brought such extraordinary demands on the Pennsylvania line that I was at last compelled to organize a night force, but it was with difficulty I obtained the consent of my superiors to entrust the charge of the line at night to a train dispatcher. Indeed, I never did get their unequivocal authority to do so, but upon my own responsibility I appointed perhaps the first night train dispatcher that ever acted in America. At least he was the first upon the Pennsylvania system. Upon our return to Pittsburgh in 1860, we rented a house in Hancock Street, now 8th Street, and resided there for a year or more. Any accurate description of Pittsburgh at that time would be set down as a piece of the grossest exaggeration. The smoke permeated and penetrated everything. If you placed your hand on the balustrade of the stair, it came away black. If you washed face and hands, they were as dirty as ever in an hour. The soot gathered in the hair and irritated the skin, and for a time after our return from the mountain atmosphere of Altoona, life was more or less miserable. We soon began to consider how we could get to the country, and fortunately at that time Mr. D. A. Stewart, then freight agent for the company, directed our attention to a house adjoining his residence at Homewood. 
We moved there at once, and the telegraph was brought in, which enabled me to operate the division from the house when necessary. Here a new life was opened to us. There were country lanes and gardens in abundance. Residences had from five to twenty acres of land about them. The Homewood estate was made up of many hundreds of acres, with beautiful woods and glens and a running brook. We too had a garden and a considerable extent of ground around our house. The happiest years of my mother's life were spent here among her flowers and chickens and the surroundings of country life. Her love of flowers was a passion. She was scarcely ever able to gather a flower. Indeed, I remember she once reproached me for pulling up a weed, saying it was something green. I have inherited this peculiarity, and have often walked from the house to the gate intending to pull a flower for my buttonhole, and then left for town unable to find one I could destroy. With this change to the country came a whole host of new acquaintances. Many of the wealthy families of the district had their residences in this delightful suburb. It was, so to speak, the aristocratic quarter. To the entertainments at these great houses, the young superintendent was invited. The young people were musical, and we had musical evenings aplenty. I heard subjects discussed, which I had never known before, and I made it a rule, when I heard these, to learn something about them at once. I was pleased every day to feel that I was learning something new. It was here that I first met the Vandevort brothers, Benjamin and John. The latter was my traveling companion on various trips which I took later in life. Dear Vandy appears as my chum in Round the World. Our neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Stewart, became more and more dear to us, and the acquaintance we had before ripened into lasting friendship. One of my pleasures is that Mr. Stewart subsequently embarked in business with us and became a partner, as Vandy did also. Greatest of all the benefits of our new home, however, was making the acquaintance of the leading family of western Pennsylvania, that of the Honorable Judge Wilkins. The judge was then approaching his eightieth year, tall, slender, and handsome, in full possession of his faculties. With a courtly grace of manner and the most wonderful store of knowledge and reminiscence of any man I had yet been privileged to meet, his wife, the daughter of George W. Dallas, Vice President of the United States, has ever been my type of gracious womanhood in age, the most beautiful, most charming, venerable old lady I ever knew or saw. Her daughter, Miss Wilkins, with her sister, Mrs. Saunders, and her children, resided in the stately mansion at Homewood, which was to the surrounding district what the baronial hall in Britain is, or should be to its district, the center of all that was cultured, refined, and elevating. To me, it was especially pleasing that I seemed to be a welcome guest there. Musical parties, charades, and theatricals, in which Miss Wilkins took the leading parts, furnished me with another means of self-improvement. The judge himself was the first man of historical note whom I had ever known. I shall never forget the impression it made upon me when, in the course of conversation, wishing to illustrate a remark, he said, President Jackson once said to me, or, I told the Duke of Wellington, so-and-so. The judge, in his earlier life, 1834, had been minister to Russia under Jackson, and in the same easy way spoke of his interview with the Tsar. It seemed to me that I was touching history itself. The house was a new atmosphere, and my intercourse with the family was a powerful stimulant to the desire for improvement of my own mind and manners. The only subject upon which there was always a decided, though silent, antagonism between the Wilkins family and myself was politics. I was an ardent free soiler, in days when to be an abolitionist was somewhat akin to being a Republican in Britain. The Wilkinses were strong Democrats with leanings toward the South, being closely connected with leading Southern families. On one occasion at Homewood, on entering the drawing room, I found the family excitedly conversing about a terrible incident that had recently occurred. "'What do you think?' said Mrs. Wilkins to me. Dallas, her grandson, writes me that he has been compelled by the commander of West Point to sit next to a negro. Did you ever hear the like of that? Is it not disgraceful? Negroes admitted to West Point. Oh, I said, Mrs. Wilkins, there is something even worse than that. I understand that some of them have been admitted to heaven. There was a silence that could be felt. 
Then dear Mrs. Wilkins said gravely, That is a different matter, Mr. Carnegie. By far the most precious gift ever received by me up to that time came about in this manner. Dear Mrs. Wilkins began knitting an afghan, and during the work many were the inquiries as to whom it was for. No, the dear queenly old lady would not tell. She kept her secret all the long months until, Christmas drawing near, the gift finished and carefully wrapped up, and her card with a few loving words enclosed, she instructed her daughter to address it to me. It was duly received in New York. Such a tribute from such a lady. Well, that Afghan, though often shown to dear friends, has not been much used. It is sacred to me and remains among my precious possessions. I had been so fortunate as to meet Lila Addison while living in Pittsburgh, the talented daughter of Dr. Addison, who had died a short time before. I soon became acquainted with the family and record with grateful feelings the immense advantage which that acquaintance also brought to me. Here was another friendship formed with people who had all the advantages of the higher education. Carlyle had been Mrs. Addison's tutor for a time, for she was an Edinburgh lady. Her daughters had been educated abroad and spoke French, Spanish, and Italian as fluently as English. It was through intercourse with this family that I first realized the indescribable yet immeasurable gulf that separates the highly educated from people like myself. But the wee drop a scotch bluid atween us proved its potency as usual. Miss Addison became an ideal friend because she undertook to improve the rough diamond, if it were indeed a diamond at all. She was my best friend, because my severest critic. I began to pay strict attention to my language, and to the English classics, which I now read with great avidity. I began also to notice how much better it was to be gentle in tone and manner, polite and courteous to all, in short, better behaved. Up to this time I had been, perhaps, careless in dress, and rather affected it. Great heavy boots, loose collar, and general roughness of attire were then peculiar to the West, and in our circle considered manly. Anything that could be labeled foppish was looked upon with contempt. I remember the first gentleman I ever saw in the service of the railway company who wore kid gloves. He was the object of derision among us who aspired to be manly men. I was a great deal the better in all these respects after we moved to Homewood, owing to the Addisons. End of chapter 7 Recording by William Tomko Eight of Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie Chapter 8 Civil War Period In 1861 the Civil War broke out and I was at once summoned to Washington by Mr. Scott who had been appointed Assistant Secretary of War in charge of the Transportation Department. I was to act as his assistant in charge of the military railroads and telegraphs of the government and to organize a force of railway men it was one of the most important departments of all at the beginning of the war the first regiments of union troops passing through baltimore had been attacked and the railway line cut between baltimore and annapolis junction destroying communication with washington it was therefore necessary for me with my corps of assistants to take train at philadelphia for annapolis a point from which a branch line extended to the junction joining the main line to washington our first duty was to repair this branch and make it passable for heavy trains, a work of some days. General Butler and several regiments of troops arrived a few days after us, and we were able to transport his whole brigade to Washington. I took my place upon the first engine which started for the capital, and proceeded very cautiously. Some distance from Washington I noticed that the telegraph wires had been pinned to the ground by wooden stakes. I stopped the engine and ran forward to release them, but I did not notice that the wires had been pulled to one side before staking. When released, in their spring upwards, they struck me in the face, knocked me over, and cut a gash in my cheek which bled profusely. 
In this condition I entered the city of Washington with the first troops, so that, with the exception of one or two soldiers, wounded a few days previously in passing through the streets of Baltimore, I can justly claim that I shed my blood for my country, among the first of its defenders. I gloried in being useful to the land that had done so much for me, and worked, I can truly say, night and day, to open communication to the South. I soon removed my headquarters to Alexandria, Virginia, and was stationed there when the unfortunate battle of Bull Run was fought. We could not believe the reports that came to us, but it soon became evident that we must rush every engine and car to the front to bring back our defeated forces. The closest point then was Burke Station. I went out there and loaded up train after train of the poor wounded volunteers. The rebels were reported to be close upon us, and we were finally compelled to close Burke Station, the operator and myself leaving on the last train for Alexandria, where the effect of panic was evident upon every side. Some of our railway men were missing, but the number at the mess on the following morning showed that, compared with other branches of the service, we had cause for congratulation. A few conductors and engineers had obtained boats and crossed the Potomac, but the great body of the men remained although the roar of the guns of the pursuing enemy was supposed to be heard in every sound during the night of our telegraphers not one was missing the next morning soon after this i returned to washington and made my headquarters in the war building with colonel scott as i had charge of the telegraph department as well as the railways this gave me an opportunity of seeing president lincoln mr seward secretary cameron and others and i was occasionally brought in personal contact with these men which was to me a source of great interest mr lincoln would occasionally come to the office and sit at the desk awaiting replies to telegrams or perhaps merely anxious for information all the pictures of this extraordinary man are like him he was so marked a feature that it was impossible for any one to paint him and not produce a likeness he was certainly one of the most homely men i ever saw when his features were in repose but when excited or telling a story intellect shone through his eyes and illuminated his face to a degree which i have seldom or never seen in any other his manners were perfect because natural and he had a kind word for everybody even the youngest boy in the office his attentions were not graduated they were the same to all as deferential in talking to the messenger boy as to secretary seward his charm lay in the total absence of manner it was not so much perhaps what he said as the way in which he said it that never failed to win one i have often regretted that i did not note down carefully at the time some of his curious sayings for he said even common things in an original way i never met a great man who so thoroughly made himself one with all men as mr lincoln as secretary hay so well says it is impossible to imagine any one a valet to mr lincoln he would have been his companion he was the most perfect democrat revealing in every word and act the equality of men when mason and slidell in eighteen sixty one were taken from the british ship trent there was intense anxiety upon the part of those who like myself knew what the right of asylum on her ships meant to britain it was certain war or else a prompt return of the prisoners secretary cameron being absent when the cabinet was summoned to consider the question mr scott was invited to attend as assistant secretary of war i did my best to let him understand that upon this issue britain would fight beyond question and urged that he stand firm for surrender especially since it had been the american doctrine that ships should be immune from search mr scott knowing nothing of foreign affairs was disposed to hold the captives but upon his return from the meeting he told me that seward had warned the cabinet it meant war just as i had said lincoln too was at first inclined to hold the prisoners but was at last converted to seward's policy the cabinet however had decided to postpone action until the morrow when cameron and other absentees would be present mr scott was requested by seward to meet cameron on arrival and get him right on the subject before going to the meeting for he was expected to be in no surrendering mood this was done and all went well next day the general confusion which reigned at washington at this time had to be seen to be understood no description can convey my initial impression of it
The first time I saw General Scott, then Commander-in-Chief, he was being helped by two men across the pavement from his office into his carriage. He was an old, decrepit man, paralyzed not only in body, but in mind, and it was upon this noble relic of the past that the organization of the forces of the Republic depended. His chief commissary, General Taylor, was in some degree a counterpart of Scott. It was our business to arrange with these, and others scarcely less fit, for the opening of communications and for the transportation of men and supplies. They were seemingly one and all martinets, who had passed the age of usefulness. Days would elapse before a decision could be obtained upon matters which required prompt action. There was scarcely a young active officer at the head of any important department. At least I cannot recall one. Long years of peace had fossilized the service. The same cause had produced like results, I understood, in the Navy Department, but I was not brought in personal contact with it. The Navy was not important at the beginning. It was the Army that counted. Nothing but defeat was to be looked for until the heads of the various departments were changed, and this could not be done in a day. The impatience of the country at the apparent delay in producing an effective weapon for the great task thrown upon the government was no doubt natural. But the wonder to me is that order was so soon evolved from the chaos which prevailed in every branch of the service. As far as our operations were concerned, we had one great advantage. Secretary Cameron authorized Mr. Scott, he had been made a colonel, to do what he thought necessary without waiting for the slow movements of the officials under the Secretary of War. Of this authority, unsparing use was made, and the important part played by the railway and telegraph department of the government from the very beginning of the war is to be attributed to the fact that we had the cordial support of Secretary Cameron. He was then in the possession of all his faculties, and grasped the elements of the problem far better than his generals and heads of departments. Popular clamor compelled Lincoln to change him at last, but those who were behind the scenes well knew that if other departments had been as well managed as was the War Department under Cameron, all things considered, much of disaster would have been avoided. Lockheel, as Cameron liked to be called, was a man of sentiment. In his ninetieth year, he visited us in Scotland, and, passing through one of our glens, sitting on the front seat of our four-in-hand coach, he reverently took off his hat and, bareheaded, rode through the glen, overcome by its grandeur. The conversation turned once upon the efforts which candidates for office must themselves put forth, and the fallacy that office seeks the man, except in very rare emergencies. Apropos of this, Lockheel told this story about Lincoln's second term. One day at Cameron's country home near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, he received a telegram saying that President Lincoln would like to see him. Accordingly, he went to Washington. Lincoln began, Cameron, the people about me are telling me that it is my patriotic duty to become a candidate for a second term, that I am the only man who can save my country and so on, and do you know I'm just beginning to be fool enough to believe them a little. What do you say, and how could it be managed? Well, Mr. President, twenty-eight years ago President Jackson sent for me, as you have now done, and told me just the same story. His letter reached me in New Orleans, and I traveled ten days to reach Washington. I told President Jackson I thought the best plan would be to have the legislature of one of the states pass resolutions insisting that the pilot should not desert the ship during these stormy times, and so forth. If one state did this, I thought others would follow. Mr. Jackson concurred, and I went to Harrisburg and had such a resolution prepared and passed. Other states followed, as I expected, and, as you know, he won a second term. Well, said Lincoln, could you do that now? No, said I. I am too near to you, Mr. President. But if you desire, I might get a friend to attend to it, I think. Well, said President Lincoln, I leave the matter with you. I sent for Foster here, who was his companion on the coach and our guest, and asked him to look up the Jackson resolutions. We changed them a little to meet new conditions and pass them. The like result followed, as in the case of President Jackson. Upon my next visit to Washington, I went in the evening to the President's public reception. 
When I entered the crowded and spacious East Room, being like Lincoln, very tall, the President recognized me over the mass of people, and holding up both white-gloved hands, which looked like two legs of mutton, called out, Two more in today, Cameron, two more. That is, two additional states had passed the Jackson-Lincoln resolutions. Apart from the light this incident throws upon political life, it is rather remarkable that the same man should have been called upon by two presidents of the United States, twenty-eight years apart, under exactly similar circumstances, and asked for advice, and that, the same expedient being employed, both men became candidates and both secured second terms. As was once explained upon a memorable occasion, there's figuring in all them things. When in Washington, I had not met General Grant, because he was in the West up to the time of my leaving. But on a journey to and from Washington, he stopped at Pittsburgh to make the necessary arrangements for his removal to the East. I met him on the line, upon both occasions, and took him to dine with me in Pittsburgh. There were no dining cars then. He was the most ordinary-looking man of high position I had ever met, and the last that one would select at first glance as a remarkable man. I remembered that Secretary of War Stanton said that when he visited the armies in the West, General Grant and his staff entered his car. He looked at them, one after the other, as they entered, and, seeing General Grant, said to himself, Well, I do not know which is General Grant, but there is one that cannot be. Yet this was he. Reading this years after it was written, I laugh. It is pretty hard on the General, for I have been taken for him more than once." In those days of the war, much was talked about strategy and the plans of the various generals. I was amazed at General Grant's freedom in talking to me about such things. Of course, he knew that I had been in the war office and was well known to Secretary Stanton, and had some knowledge of what was going on, but my surprise can be imagined when he said to me, Well, the President and Stanton want me to go east and take command there, and I have agreed to do it. I am just going west to make the necessary arrangements. I said, I suspected as much. I am going to put Sherman in charge, he said. That will surprise the country, I said, for I think the impression is that General Thomas should succeed. Yes, I know that, he said, but I know the men, and Thomas will be the first to say that Sherman is the man for the work. There will be no trouble about that. The fact is, the western end is pretty far down, and the next thing we must do is to push the eastern end down a little. That was exactly what he did, and that was Grant's way of putting strategy into words. It was my privilege to become well acquainted with him in after years. If ever a man was without the slightest trace of affectation, Grant was that man. Even Lincoln did not surpass him in that. But Grant was a quiet, slow man, while Lincoln was always alive and in motion. I never heard Grant use a long or grand word, or make any attempt at manner, but the general impression that he was always reticent is a mistake. He was a surprisingly good talker sometimes, and upon occasion liked to talk. His sentences were always short and to the point, and his observations upon things remarkably shrewd. When he had nothing to say, he said nothing. I noticed that he was never tired of praising his subordinates in the war. He spoke of them as a fond father speaks of his children. The story is told that during the trials of war in the West, General Grant began to indulge too freely in liquor. His chief of staff, Rawlins, boldly ventured to tell him so. That this was the act of a true friend, Grant fully recognized. You do not mean that. I was wholly unconscious of it. I am surprised, said the general. Yes, I do mean it. It is even beginning to be a subject of comment among your officers. Why did you not tell me before? I'll never drink a drop of liquor again. He never did. Time after time, in later years, dining with the Grants in New York, I have seen the general turn down the wine glasses at his side. That indomitable will of his enabled him to remain steadfast to his resolve, a rare case as far as my experience goes. Some have refrained for a time. In one noted case, one of our partners refrained for three years. But alas, the old enemy at last recaptured its victim. Grant, when president, was accused of being pecuniarily benefited by certain appointments, 
or acts of his administration, while his friends knew that he was so poor that he had been compelled to announce his intention of abandoning the customary state dinners, each one of which he found cost eight hundred dollars, a sum which he could not afford to pay out of his salary. The increase of the presidential salary from $25,000 to $50,000 a year enabled him, during his second term, to save a little, although he cared no more about money than about uniforms. At the end of his first term, I know he had nothing. Yet I found, when in Europe, that the impression was widespread among the highest officials there that there was something in the charge that General Grant had benefited pecuniarily by appointments. We know in America how little weight to attach to these charges, but it would have been well for those who made them so recklessly to have considered what effect they would produce upon public opinion in other lands. The cause of democracy suffers more in Britain today from the generally received opinion that American politics are corrupt, and therefore that republicanism necessarily produces corruption, than from any other one cause. Yet, speaking with some knowledge of politics in both lands, I have not the slightest hesitation in saying that for every ounce of corruption of public men in the new land of republicanism, there is one in the old land of monarchy. Only the forms of corruption differ. Titles are the bribes in the monarchy, not dollars. Office is a common and proper reward in both. There is, however, this difference in favor of the monarchy. Titles are given openly, and are not considered by the recipients of the mass of the people as bribes. When I was called to Washington in 1861, it was supposed that the war would soon be over, but it was seen shortly afterwards that it was to be a question of years. Permanent officials in charge would be required. The Pennsylvania Railroad Company was unable to spare Mr. Scott, and Mr. Scott, in turn, decided that I must return to Pittsburgh, where my services were urgently needed, owing to the demands made upon the Pennsylvania by the government. We therefore placed the department at Washington in the hands of others, and returned to our respective positions. After my return from Washington, reaction followed, and I was taken with my first serious illness. I was completely broken down and after a struggle to perform my duties, was compelled to seek rest. One afternoon, when on the railway line in Virginia, I had experienced something like a sunstroke, which gave me considerable trouble. It passed off, however, but after that I found I could not stand heat and had to be careful to keep out of the sun, a hot day wilting me completely. That is the reason why the cool highland air in summer has been to me a panacea for many years. My physician has insisted that I must avoid our hot American summers. Leave of absence was granted me by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, and the long-sought opportunity to visit Scotland came. My mother, my bosom friend Tom Miller, and myself sailed in the steamship Etna, June 28, 1862. I, in my 27th year, and on landing in Liverpool, we proceeded at once to Dunfermline. No change ever affected me so much as this return to my native land. I seemed to be in a dream. Every mile that brought us nearer to Scotland increased the intensity of my feelings. My mother was equally moved, and I remember when her eyes first caught sight of the familiar yellow bush, she exclaimed, Oh, there's the broom, the broom. Her heart was so full she could not restrain her tears, and the more I tried to make light of it, or to soothe her, the more she was overcome. For myself, I felt as if I could throw myself upon the sacred soil and kiss it. In this mood we reached Dunfermline. Every object we passed was recognized at once, but everything seemed so small, compared with what I had imagined it, that I was completely puzzled. Finally, reaching Uncle Lauder's and getting into the old room where he had taught Dodd and myself so many things, I exclaimed, You are all here. Everything is just as I left it. But you are now all playing with toys. The High Street, which I had considered not a bad Broadway, Uncle Shop, which I had compared with some New York establishments, the little mounds about the town to which we had run on Sundays to play, the distances, the height of the houses, all had shrunk. Here was a city of the Lilliputians. I could almost touch the eaves of the house in which I was born, and the sea, to walk to which on a Saturday had been considered quite a feat, was only three miles distant. The rocks at the seashore, among which I had gathered Wilkes, 
whelks, seemed to have vanished, and a tame flat shoal remained. The schoolhouse, around which had centered many of my schoolboy recollections, my only alma mater, and the playground, upon which mimic battles had been fought and races run, had shrunk into ridiculously small dimensions. The fine residences, Broom Hall, Fordell, and especially the conservatories at Donnerbristle, fell one after the other into the petty and insignificant. What I felt on a later occasion on a visit to Japan, with its small toy houses, was something like a repetition of the impression my old home made upon me. Everything was there in miniature, even the old well at the head of Moody Street, where I began my early struggles, was changed from what I had pictured it. But one object remained all that I had dreamed of it. There was no disappointment in the glorious old abbey and its glen. It was big enough and grand enough, and the memorable carved letters on the top of the tower, King Robert the Bruce, filled my eye and my heart as fully as of old. Nor was the Abbey Bell disappointing when I heard it for the first time after my return. For this I was grateful. It gave me a rallying point, and around the old Abbey, with its palace ruins and the glen, other objects adjusted themselves in their true proportions after a time. My relatives were exceedingly kind, and the oldest of all, my dear old Auntie Charlotte, in a moment of exultation, exclaimed, Oh, you will just be coming back here some day and keep a shop in the high street. To keep a shop in the high street was her idea of triumph. Her son-in-law and daughter, both my full cousins, though unrelated to each other, had risen to this sublime height, and nothing was too great to predict for her promising nephew. There is an aristocracy even in shopkeeping, and the family of the green grocer of the high street mingles not upon equal terms with him of Moody Street. Auntie, who had often played my nurse, liked to dwell upon the fact that I was a screaming infant that had to be fed with two spoons, as I yelled whenever one left my mouth. Captain Jones, our superintendent of the steelworks, at a later day, described me as having been born with two rows of teeth and holes punched for more. So insatiable was my appetite for new works and increased production. As I was the first child in our immediate family circle, there were plenty of now venerable relatives begging to be allowed to play nurse, my aunties among them. Many of my childhood pranks and words they told me in their old age. One of them that the aunties remembered struck me as rather precocious. I had been brought up upon wise saws, and one that my father had taught me was soon given direct application. As a boy, returning from the seashore three miles distant, he had to carry me part of the way upon his back. Going up a steep hill in the gloaming, he remarked upon the heavy load, hoping probably I would propose to walk a bit. The response, however, which he received was, Ah, father, never mind. Patience and perseverance make the man. You can? He toiled on with his burden, but shaking with laughter. He was hoist with his own petard, but his burden grew lighter all the same. I am sure of this. My home, of course, was with my instructor, guide, and inspirer, Uncle Lauder, he who had done so much to make me romantic, patriotic, and poetical at eight. Now I was twenty-seven, but Uncle Lauder still remained Uncle Lauder. He had not shrunk. No one could fill his place. We had our walks and talks constantly, and I was nag again to him. He had never had any name for me but that, and never did have. My dear, dear uncle, and more, much more than uncle to me. I was still dreaming and so excited that I could not sleep and had caught cold in the bargain. The natural result of this was a fever. I lay in uncle's house for six weeks, a part of that time in a critical condition. Scottish medicine was then as stern as Scottish theology, both are now much softened, and I was bled. My thin American blood was so depleted that when I was pronounced convalescent, it was long before I could stand upon my feet. This illness put an end to my visit, but by the time I had reached America again, the ocean voyage had done me so much good, I was able to resume work. I remember being deeply affected by the reception I met with when I returned to my division. The men of the eastern end had gathered together with a cannon, and while the train passed, I was greeted with a salvo. 
This was perhaps the first occasion upon which my subordinates had an opportunity of making me the subject of any demonstration, and their reception made a lasting impression. I knew how much I cared for them, and it was pleasing to know that they reciprocated my feelings. Working men always do reciprocate kindly feeling. If we truly care for others, we need not be anxious about their feelings for us. Like draws to like. End of chapter 8 Recording by William Tomko of Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko Autobiography of Andrew Carnegie by Andrew Carnegie Chapter 9 Bridge Building During the Civil War, the price of iron went up to something like $130 per ton. Even at that figure, it was not so much a question of money as of delivery. The railway lines of America were fast becoming dangerous for want of new rails, and this state of affairs led me to organize, in 1864, a rail-making concern at Pittsburgh. There was no difficulty in obtaining partners and capital, and the superior rail mill and blast furnaces were built. In like manner, the demand for locomotives was very great, and with Mr. Thomas N. Miller, I organized in 1866 the Pittsburgh Locomotive Works, which has been a prosperous and creditable concern. Locomotives made there having obtained an enviable reputation throughout the United States. It sounds like a fairy tale today to record that in 1906 the $100 shares of this company sold for $3,000 that is, thirty dollars for one. Large annual dividends had been paid regularly, and the company had been very successful. Sufficient proof of the policy, make nothing but the very best. We never did. When at Altoona, I had seen in the Pennsylvania Railroad Company's works the first small bridge built of iron. It proved a success. I saw that it would never do to depend further upon wooden bridges for permanent railway structures. An important bridge on the Pennsylvania Railroad had recently burned, and the traffic had been obstructed for eight days. Iron was the thing. I proposed to H. J. Linville, who had designed the iron bridge, and to John L. Piper and his partner, Mr. Schiffler, who had charge of bridges on the Pennsylvania line, that they should come to Pittsburgh, and I would organize a company to build iron bridges. It was the first company of its kind. I asked my friend, Mr. Scott, of the Pennsylvania Railroad, to go with us in the venture, which he did. Each of us paid for a one-fifth interest, or $1,250. My share I borrowed from the bank. Looking back at it now, the sum seemed very small, but tall oaks from little acorns grow. In this way was organized in 1862 the firm of Piper and Schiffler, which was merged into the Keystone Bridge Company in 1863, a name which I remember I was proud of having thought of as being most appropriate for a bridge-building concern in the state of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State. From this beginning, iron bridges came generally into use in America, indeed in the world at large, so far as I know. My letters to iron manufacturers in Pittsburgh were sufficient to ensure the new company credit. Small wooden shops were erected, and several bridge structures were undertaken. Cast iron was the principal material used, but so well were the bridges built that some made at that day, and since strengthened for heavier traffic, still remain in use upon various lines. The question of bridging the Ohio River at Steubenville came up, and we were asked whether we would undertake to build a railway bridge with a span of 300 feet over the channel. It seemed ridiculous at the present day to think of the serious doubts entertained about our ability to do this. But it must be remembered, this was before the days of steel and almost before the use of wrought iron in America. The top cords and supports were all of cast iron. I urged my partners to try it anyhow, and we finally closed the contract. But I remember well when President Jewett of the railway company visited the works and cast his eyes upon the piles of heavy cast iron lying about, which were parts of the forthcoming bridge, that he turned to me and said, I don't believe these heavy castings can be made to stand up and carry themselves, much less carry a train across the Ohio River.' 
The judge, however, lived to believe differently. The bridge remained until recently, though strengthened to carry heavier traffic. We expected to make quite a sum by this first important undertaking. But owing to the inflation of the currency, which occurred before the work was finished, our margin of profit was almost swallowed up. It is an evidence of the fairness of President Edgar Thompson of the Pennsylvania that, upon learning the facts of the case, he allowed an extra sum to secure us from loss. The subsequent position of affairs, he said, was not contemplated by either party when the contract was made. A great and a good man was Edgar Thompson, a close bargainer for the Pennsylvania Railroad, but ever mindful of the fact that the spirit of the law was above the letter. In Linville, Piper and Schiffler, we had the best talent of that day. Linville, an engineer, Piper, a hustling, active mechanic, and Schiffler, sure and steady. Colonel Piper was an exceptional man. I heard President Thompson of the Pennsylvania once say he would rather have him at a burnt bridge than all the engineering corps. There was one subject upon which the colonel displayed great weakness, fortunately for us, and that was the horse. Whenever a business discussion became too warm, and the colonel showed signs of temper, which was not seldom, it was a sure cure to introduce that subject. Everything else would pass from his mind. He became absorbed in the fascinating topic of horse flesh. If he had overworked himself, and we wished to get him to take a holiday, we sent him to Kentucky to look after a horse or two that one or the other of us was desirous of obtaining, and for the selection of which we would trust no one but himself. But his craze for horses sometimes brought him into serious difficulties. He made his appearance at the office one day, with one half of his face as black as mud could make it, his clothes torn and his hat missing, but still holding the whip in one hand. He explained that he had attempted to drive a fast Kentucky colt. One of the reins had broken, and he had lost his steerage way, as he expressed it. He was a grand fellow pipe, as we called him, and when he took a fancy to a person, as he did to me, he was for and with him always. In later days, when I removed to New York, he transferred his affections to my brother, whom he invariably called Thomas, instead of Tom. High as I stood in his favor, my brother afterwards stood higher. He fairly worshipped him, and anything that Tom said was law and gospel. He was exceedingly jealous of our other establishments, in which he was not directly interested, such as our mills, which supplied the Keystone Works with iron. Many a dispute arose between the mill managers and the colonel as to quality, price, and so forth. On one occasion, he came to my brother to complain that a bargain which he had made for the supply of iron for a year had not been copied correctly. The prices were net, and nothing had been said about net when the bargain was made. He wanted to know just what that word, net, meant. Well, Colonel, said my brother, it means that nothing more is to be added. All right, Thomas, said the Colonel, entirely satisfied. There was much in the way one puts things. Nothing to be deducted might have caused a dispute. He was made furious one day by Broad Street's volume, which gives the standing of business concerns. Never having seen such a book before, he was naturally anxious to see what rating his concern had. When he read that the Keystone Bridge Works were B.C., which meant bad credit, it was with difficulty he was restrained from going to see our lawyers to have a suit brought against the publishers. Tom, however, explained to him that the Keystone Bridge Works were in bad credit because they never borrowed anything, and he was pacified. No debt was one of the Colonel's hobbies. Once, when I was leaving for Europe, when many firms were hard up and some failing around us, he said to me, The sheriff can't get us when you are gone if I don't sign any notes, can he? No, I said, he can't. All right, we'll be here when you come back. Talking of the colonel reminds me of another unusual character with whom we were brought in contact in these bridge-building days. This was Captain Eads of St. Louis an original genius minus scientific knowledge to guide his erratic ideas of things mechanical. He was seemingly one of those who wished to have everything done upon his own original plans. That a thing had been done in one way before was sufficient to cause its rejection. When his plans for the St. Louis Bridge were presented to us, I handed them to the one man in the United States who knew the subject best, our Mr. Linville. He came to me in great concern, saying, 
The bridge, if built upon these plans, will not stand up. It will not carry its own weight. Well, I said, Captain Eads will come to see you, and in talking over matters, explain this to him gently. Get it into proper shape. Lead him into the straight path, and say nothing about it to others. This was successfully accomplished, but in the construction of the bridge, poor Piper was totally unable to comply with the extraordinary requirements of the captain. At first, he was so delighted with having received the largest contract that had yet been let, that he was all graciousness to Captain Eads. It was not even Captain at first, but Colonel Eads. How do you do? Delighted to see you. By and by, matters became a little complicated. We noticed that the greeting became less cordial, but still it was, Good morning, Captain Eads. This fell till we were surprised to hear Pipe talking of Mr. Eads. Before the troubles were over, the colonel had fallen to Jim Eads, and, to tell the truth, long before the work was out of the shops, Jim was now and then preceded by a big D. A man may be possessed of great ability, and be a charming, interesting character, as Captain Eads undoubtedly was, and yet not be able to construct the first bridge of five hundred feet span over the Mississippi River, without availing himself of the scientific knowledge and practical experience of others. When the work was finished, I had the colonel with me in St. Louis for some days, protecting the bridge against a threatened attempt on the part of others to take possession of it before we obtained full payment. When the colonel had taken up the planks at both ends, and organized a plan of relieving the men who stood guard, he became homesick, and exceedingly anxious to return to Pittsburgh. He had determined to take the night train, and I was at a loss to know how to keep him with me, until I thought of his one vulnerable point. I told him, during the day, how anxious I was to obtain a pair of horses for my sister. I wished to make her a present of a span, and I had heard that St. Louis was a noted place for them. Had he seen anything superb? The bait took. He launched forth into a description of several spans of horses he had seen, and stables he had visited. I asked him if he could possibly stay over and select the horses. I knew very well that he would wish to see them and drive them many times, which would keep him busy. It happened just as I expected. He purchased a splendid pair, but then another difficulty occurred about transporting them to Pittsburgh. He would not trust them by rail, and no suitable boat was to leave for several days. Providence was on my side, evidently. Nothing on earth would induce that man to leave the city until he saw those horses fairly started, and it was an even wager whether he would not insist upon going up on the steamer with them himself. We held the bridge. Pipe made a splendid Horatius. He was one of the best men and one of the most valuable partners I ever was favored with, and richly deserved the rewards which he did so much to secure. The Keystone Bridge works have always been a source of satisfaction to me. Almost every concern that had undertaken to erect iron bridges in America had failed. Many of the structures themselves had fallen, and some of the worst railway disasters in America had been caused in that way. Some of the bridges had given way under wind pressure, but nothing has ever happened to a keystone bridge, and some of them have stood where the wind was not tempered. There had been no luck about it. We used only the best material, and enough of it, making our own iron, and later our own steel. We were our own severest inspectors, and would build a safe structure or none at all. When asked to build a bridge which we knew to be of insufficient strength or of unscientific design, we resolutely declined. Any piece of work bearing the stamp of the Keystone Bridge Works, and there are few states in the Union where such are not to be found, we were prepared to underwrite. We were as proud of our bridges as Carlyle was of the bridge his father built across the Annan. An honest brig, as the great son rightly said. This policy is a true secret of success. Uphill work it will be for a few years, until your work is proven, but after that it is smooth sailing. Instead of objecting to inspectors, they should be welcomed by all manufacturing establishments. A high standard of excellence is easily maintained, and men are educated in the effort to reach excellence. I have never known a concern to make a decided success that did not do good, honest work, and even in these days of the fiercest competition, when everything would seem to be a matter of price, there lies still at the root of great business success the very much more important factor of quality.' 
the effect of attention to quality upon every man in the service from the president of the concern down to the humblest laborer cannot be overestimated and bearing on the same question clean fine workshops and tools well kept yards and surroundings are of much greater importance than is usually supposed i was very much pleased to hear a remark made by one of the prominent bankers who visited the edgar thompson works during a bankers convention held at pittsburgh he was one of a party of some hundreds of delegates and after they had passed through the works he said to our manager somebody appears to belong to these works he put his finger there upon one of the secrets of success they did belong to somebody the president of an important manufacturing work once boasted to me that their men had chased away the first inspector who had ventured to appear among them and that they had never been troubled with another since this was said as a matter of sincere congratulation but i thought to myself this concern will never stand the strain of competition it is bound to fail when hard times come the result proved the correctness of my belief the surest foundation of a manufacturing concern is quality after that and a long way after comes cost i gave a great deal of personal attention for some years to the affairs of the keystone bridge works and when important contracts were involved often went myself to meet the parties on one such occasion in eighteen sixty eight i visited dubuque iowa with our engineer walter caddy we were competing for the building of the most important railway bridge that had been built up to that time a bridge across the wide mississippi at dubuque to span which was considered a great undertaking we found the river frozen and crossed it upon a sleigh drawn by four horses that visit proved how much success turns upon trifles we found we were not the lowest bidder our chief rival was a bridge building concern in chicago to which the board had decided to award the contract i lingered and talked with some of the directors they were delightfully ignorant of the merits of cast and wrought iron we had always made the upper cord of the bridge of the latter while our rivals was made of cast iron this furnished my text i pictured the result of a steamer striking against the one and against the other in the case of the wrought iron cord it would probably only bend in the case of the cast iron it would certainly break and down would come the bridge one of the directors the well-known perry smith was fortunately able to enforce my argument by stating to the board that what i said was undoubtedly the case about cast iron the other night he had run his buggy in the dark against a lamp-post which was of cast iron and the lamp-post had broken to pieces am i to be censured if i had little difficulty here in recognizing something akin to the hand of providence with perry smith the manifest agent ah gentlemen i said there is the point a little more money and you could have had the indestructible wrought iron and your bridge would stand against any steamboat we never have built and we never will build a cheap bridge ours don't fall there was a pause then the president of the bridge company mr allison the great senator asked if i would excuse them for a few moments i retired soon they recalled me and offered the contract provided we took the lowest price which was only a few thousand dollars less i agreed to the concession that cast-iron lamp-post so opportunely smashed gave us one of our most profitable contracts and what is more obtained for us the reputation of having taken the dubuque bridge against all competitors it also laid the foundation for me of a lifelong unbroken friendship with one of america's best and most valuable public men senator allison the moral of that story lies on the surface if you want a contract be on the spot when it is let a smashed lamp-post or something equally unthought of may secure the prize if the bidder be on hand and if possibly stay on hand until you can take the written contract home in your pocket this we did at dubuque although it was suggested we could leave and it would be sent after us to execute we preferred to remain being anxious to see more of the charms of dubuque after building the Steubenville Bridge, it became a necessity for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company to build bridges across the Ohio River at Parkersburg and Wheeling to prevent their great rival, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, from possessing a decided advantage. The days of ferry boats were then fast passing away. It was in connection with the contracts for these bridges that I had the pleasure of making the acquaintance of a man, then of great position, Mr. Garrett, 
president of the Baltimore and Ohio. We were most anxious to secure both bridges, and all the approaches to them, but I found Mr. Garrett decidedly of the opinion that we were quite unable to do so much work in the time specified. He wished to build the approaches and the short spans in his own shops, and asked me if we would permit him to use our patents. I replied that we would feel highly honored by the Baltimore and Ohio doing so. The stamp of approval of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad would be worth ten times the patent fees. He could use all and everything we had. There was no doubt as to the favorable impression that made upon the great railway magnate. He was much pleased and, to my utter surprise, took me into his private room and opened up a frank conversation upon matters in general. He touched especially upon his quarrels with the Pennsylvania Railroad people, with Mr. Thompson and Mr. Scott, the President and Vice President, whom he knew to be my special friends. This led me to say that I had passed through Philadelphia on my way to see him and had been asked by Mr. Scott where I was going. I told him that I was going to visit you to obtain the contracts for your great bridges over the Ohio River. Mr. Scott said it was not often that I went on a fool's errand, but that I was certainly on one now, that Mr. Garrett would never think for a moment of giving me his contracts for every one knew that I was, as a former employee, always friendly to the Pennsylvania Railroad. Well, I said, we shall build Mr. Garrett's bridges. Mr. Garrett promptly replied that when the interests of his company were at stake, it was the best always that won. His engineers had reported that our plans were the best, and that Scott and Thompson would see that he had only one rule, the interests of his company. Although he very well knew that I was a Pennsylvania Railroad man, yet he felt it his duty to award us the work. The negotiation was still unsatisfactory to me, because we were to get all the difficult part of the work, the great spans of which the risk was then considerable, while Mr. Garrett was to build all the small and profitable spans at his own shops upon our plans and patents. I ventured to ask whether he was dividing the work because he honestly believed we could not open his bridge for traffic as soon as his masonry would permit. He admitted he was. I told him that he need not have any fear upon that point. Mr. Garrett, I said, would you consider my personal bond a good security? Certainly, he said. Well, now, I replied, bind me. I know what I am doing. I will take the risk. How much of a bond do you want me to give you that your bridges will be open for traffic at the specified time if you give us the entire contract, provided you get your masonry ready? Well, I would want a hundred thousand dollars from you, young man. All right, I said. Prepare your bond. Give us the work. Our firm is not going to let me lose a hundred thousand dollars. You know that. Yes, he said. I believe if you are bound for a hundred thousand dollars, your company will work day and night, and I will get my bridges. This was the arrangement which gave us what were then the gigantic contracts of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. It is needless to say that I never had to pay that bond. My partners knew much better than Mr. Garrett the conditions of his work. The Ohio River was not to be trifled with, and long before his masonry was ready, we had relieved ourselves from all responsibility upon the bond by placing the superstructure on the banks awaiting the completion of the substructure which he was still building. Mr. Garrett was very proud of his Scottish blood, and Burns, having been once touched upon between us, we became firm friends. He afterwards took me to his fine mansion in the country. He was one of the few Americans who then lived in the grand style of a country gentleman, with many hundreds of acres of beautiful land, park-like drives, a stud of thoroughbred horses, with cattle, sheep, and dogs, and a home that realized what one had read of the country life of a nobleman in England. At a later date, he had fully determined that his railroad company should engage in the manufacture of steel rails and had applied for the right to use the Bessemer patents. This was a matter of great moment to us. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company was one of our best customers, and we were naturally anxious to prevent the building of steel rail rolling mills at Cumberland. It would have been a losing enterprise for the Baltimore and Ohio, for I was sure it would buy its steel rails at a much cheaper rate than it could possibly make the small quantity needed for itself. I visited Mr. Garrett to talk the matter over with him. He was then much pleased with the foreign commerce and the lines of steamships which made Baltimore their port. 
He drove me, accompanied by several of his staff, to the wharves where he was to decide upon their extension, and as the foreign goods were being discharged from the steamship side and placed in the railway cars, he turned to me and said, Mr. Carnegie, you can now begin to appreciate the magnitude of our vast system and understand why it is necessary that we should make everything for ourselves, even our steel rails. We cannot depend upon private concerns to supply us with any of the principal articles we consume. We shall be a world to ourselves. Well, I said, Mr. Garrett, it is all very grand, but really your vast system does not overwhelm me. I read your last annual report and saw that you collected last year for transporting the goods of others the sum of fourteen millions of dollars. The firms I control dug the material from the hills, made their own goods, and sold them to a much greater value than that. You are really a very small concern compared with Carnegie Brothers and Company. My railroad apprenticeship came in there to advantage. We heard no more of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company entering into competition with us. Mr. Garrett and I remained good friends to the end. He even presented me with a Scotch collie dog of his own rearing. That I had been a Pennsylvania railroad man was drowned in the wee drop a scotch bluid atween us. End of chapter nine. Recording by William Tomko.